from the headquarters of Telesur English in Quito, Ecuador. I am Estefania Bravo. This is from the South. The UN Secretary General Antonio Guterres has left Libya after a brief visit. Guterres says he is deeply concerned about a potential new civil war. The UN Security Council has scheduled a meeting to discuss the current situation in the country. With uh, a deep concern and a heavy heart, I still hope it will be possible to avoid a bloody confrontation in and around Tripoli and uh, the United Nations remain uh, available to facilitate any political solution able to unify the Libyan institutions and uh, whatever happens the UN will remain committed and I will remain committed to support the Libyan people. Libyans deserve peace, security, prosperity and the respect of their human rights. Thank you very much. Our correspondent in the Middle East, Hissam Wanus, brings us more details. The military escalation is intensifying in Libya after the announcement made by Marshal Khalifa Haftar, head of the Libyan National Army, which controls the east of Libya and does not recognize the government of Fayez al Sarraj. It's important to know that the Libyan National Army is advancing towards the capital and has taken control of different cities and villages in the southwest of Tripoli. Even some neighbors in the capital are under its control. Marshal Khalifa Haftar said that his army could take control of the whole capital in around 48 hours unless there is some foreign intervention. A spokesperson of the Libyan National Army said the only factor that could be an obstacle for taking the capital could be an intervention. Meanwhile, the government in Tripoli has declared an state of emergency and deployed its troops, ruining the use of force to protect civilians. However, heads of the Libyan National Army have said that members of Al-Qaeda have arrived in Tripoli from Syria. Marshal Khalifa Haftar says he will fight terrorist and that he wants to take part in the Summit for National Reconciliation, scheduled for April 14th, promoted by the United Nations. Marshal Khalifa Haftar says he ruled not to attack civilians, nor foreigners. Libya is divided since Gaddafi was defeated in 2011, with different forces fighting to take control of the country. Jihadists and criminal groups are also operating in the country. The situation in Libya is quite complicated and concerns among the international community have increased. As tensions escalate between a Libyan commander, Khalifa, Khalifa Aftar, and the UN-backed government of Accord, let's take an inside look at what is happening in the country. This large convoy of heavily armed military vehicles had been seen moving towards the Libyan capital, Tripoli, on Thursday. The Libyan National Army fleet started their advance after their commander, Khalifa Haftar, made an appeal in an audio recording posted online. Heroes, the time has come. It is time to advance, as you have always done with a firm step towards Tripoli and to enter peacefully. Only point your weapons at those who have decided to fight and combat us. Only shoot at those who have decided to shoot and want bloodshed. Those who put down their weapons will be spared. Soon, the head of the United Nations-backed Government of National Accord meets his troops to oversee that the LNA is stopped from entering the capital. Haftar's forces were pushed back from the key location, less than 30 kilometers from the capital. The time has come for Zawiya and its combatants, fighters and revolutionaries. We have done a great mission for this precious land. These internal military tensions arise at a time when the UN chief Antonio Guterres was visiting the country. Guterres came to prepare a national reconciliation conference to be held later this month between the various factions in the scramble for power in Libya. I want to make a very strong appeal an appeal for all military movements to stop, an appeal for containment, calm, 
de-escalation, both military and political and verbal de-escalation. Experts say this latest development could lead to a military confrontation between the forces of the UN-backed government of Prime Minister Fayaz al-Saraj and Commander Khalifa Haftar. Both sides have been fighting for power since 2014. This escalation in tension is the most severe in this oil-rich country since the execution of the Libyan leader Muammar Gaddafi in 2011 by NATO-backed forces. The social media is growing across Colombia with more supporters joining on the 27th day of demonstrations. Students of the University of Cauca ratified their support for the protests led by communities of indigenous Afro descendants and campesino people. Organizers say the Minga Social won't stop until President Ivan Duque negotiates and recognizes their demands. More than 12,000 people have joined the protest. Meanwhile, a group of Colombian activists have been mobilizing in Europe, demanding an end to the persecution of Colombian social leaders. They will march from Paris to The Hague, more than 400 kilometers away, to denounce the 570 murders of leaders and activists since the peace agreements were signed in 2016. Colombia's President Ivan Duque has not explained yet why the Venezuelan military deserters remain in the border city of Cúcuta. Videos have been circulating which suggest they are receiving training as part of the so-called freedom operation announced by the opposition figure Juan Guaido to remove the government in Venezuela. Senator Antonio Sanguino has condemned the fact that Venezuelan deserters could be receiving training in hotels on Colombian territory to prepare a military operation against the government of Nicolás Maduro. There are videos in which soldiers appear with hoods on and admit that they are part of Operation Freedom and that the operation is waiting for orders from the supposed interim president Juan Guaido to begin military action against the Venezuelan National Guard, which is loyal to President Maduro. In this video, one of them speaks with an air military authority in an attempt to split the armed forces. We are here in the city with only one mission, which is to free our country following the instructions given by our commander-in-chief, Juan Guaidó, as part of Operation Libertad. The Colombian government denies all this, but it still hasn't clarified the situation of these former soldiers in Colombia one month after they entered the country. There is no military training in Cúcuta. That is false. And anyone who says that, and I say this bluntly, although I don't like to use the word, is lying. The only training they might be receiving from the National Training Institute is information technology and communications. The human rights defender Wilfredo Cañizares says the Colombian government must explain if these former soldiers are refugees, why are they still being kept in hotels in Cucuta and Villa del Rosario, and why are they talking about Operation Freedom? There is no reason for them to be in places like these, for them to be locked up and prevented from leaving or speaking to anyone. They are virtually imprisoned. What is the Colombian government waiting for? What is it organizing with these soldiers? Why do they refuse to deal with this matter publicly and transparently? The UN Agency for Refugees, the ACNUR, has also not said anything about these actions, which would contravene the international rules on refugees and would also mean that President Ivan Duque is in breach of the Colombian constitution. The National Teachers Union in Mexico has taken to the streets in the capital, Mexico City, asking the government to include their demands in an upcoming labor reform. Our correspondent, Eduardo Martinez from Mexico City, reports from the ground. We are at a demonstration organized by the National Teachers Union. Teachers are asking President Andrés Manuel López Obrador 
that their demands are included in an upcoming labor reform. They are also asking that the reform pass during the presidency of Enrique Peña Nieto be annulled since they said it is putting their employment at risk. Union leaders continue holding talks with the government of López Obrador. The president has asked the Secretary of Public Education to attend the demands of the demonstrators and include their suggestions in a draft bill that is still waiting to be debated in Congress. One of their main demands is that all labor-related issues should be included in the Article 123 of the Constitution, a section that refers to the working conditions of state workers. Teachers are also demanding that the government allocate the necessary funds to re built the school that were destroyed by the earthquake of 2017. That was Eduardo Martinez from Mexico City. The United States military reinforced the El Paso Ciudad Juarez border on Thursday by laying barbed wire and putting up barricades. U.S. President Donald Trump repeated his threat to close the border, saying Congress could prevent such a shutdown by changing laws to fix what he called immigration loopholes. Trump has employed nationalistic and racist rhetoric to, to suggest there, there is a migration crisis in the U.S. and has demanded a wall be built along the border. Most migrants arriving at the border are Central American families seeking asylum. Trump threatened Mexico with economic consequences if it doesn't assist in limiting migration to the U.S. Only one week ago, the U.S. president said he may close the border Mexico between the two countries, but has since backtracked, offering what he called a one-year warning. I think, as I said, migration is an economic and social phenomena. So migration, not only in Mexico but around the world, cannot be stopped. What, what we need is to have a orderly, regular, and safe migration, and it is what the Mexican government is aiming to. Migration will never be stopped, it's intrinsic to humanity. But what we can do is do it in a regular way, in an orderly way that protects human rights. And as a consequence of the current hostile U.S. stance on migration, officials in Mexico appear to be trying to slow down the migratory process towards the U.S. through assistance and labor programs. However, the Mexican government has denied that it has changed its policy in response to the U.S. threats. What people want are their humanitarian visas to cross the country in less time possible and reach the United States, where they will face another migration process, which the U.S. will determine. But what Mexico is doing is solving the problem for the United States, and they are turning this region of the country into a true social laboratory, where there is everything from corruption due to omission and for a commission. We'll be back very soon. Stay with us. Welcome back. The Plan de la Patria, or Plan of the, no of the Nation, which has been passed into law, will be implemented as the main framework for economic development and social inclusion in Venezuela. It is already receiving widespread support from people in several communities who see it as a symbol of hope for a better future. People throughout the country are waking in on the Plan de la Patria near days after it was approved by the Constituent National Assembly. Here in the Caracas community, residents say that they believe the plan will improve the current economic situation and help lift them out of poverty. They see improvements in health, housing, education and other essential services. The social housing program really changed my life. I have never imagined I was about to have access to a home as this one. Because even though my husband and I, we both work, the years when our children were small, we could have never have a house. We had never been able to get the initial fee to buy it. The Plan de la Patria presented by Planning Minister Ricardo Menéndez was approved on Tuesday. It serves as a roadmap for the Bolivarian project. It also reaffirms socialism as the model of development for Venezuela to follow, even when the country is under siege. The Plan de la Patria is not an academic instrument. It's an inclusive, transformative initiative for all women and men, absolutely. Only revolutionaries such as us, Bolivarians under Nicolás Maduro's direction, can guarantee peace and sovereignty. 
It's a continuation of Commander Hugo Chavez's project on Legacy. This initiative containing more than 1,000 developmental objectives, it's a strategy that will be used as a type of economic defense of the population in the face of crippling sanctions. The sanctions are part of an economic and multidimensional war against Venezuela. Since Maduro took office in 2013, he promised to maintain the five original objectives of the plan. His resolve was deepened by millions of Venezuelans who form popular assemblies, technical committees and use digital platforms. This urban complex is a place that Commander Chavez dreamed of and built with his own hands. It's something concrete and tangible. It's one of the main symbols of merit, and it's part of a new society in Venezuela. President Nicolás Maduro requested that the Plan de la Patria be made law. And I ask you to please take this plan, study it, improve it, change it, transform it, and soon we'll deliver it to the country as the Patria Law 2019 to 2025, with obligatory compliance from all citizens. The plan, which has been approved as a new law, is built on the concept of the individual above capital, which challenges existing models. The police in Rio de Janeiro have found that the fire that destroyed the National Museum started in an air conditioning unit. Seven months of investigation found that the power circuit of the air conditioning unit did not follow the Supler recommendations. According to the police, it was the first floor that caught on fire first and then spread through the building. The museum collection was destroyed after six hours of blaze. Of blaze. More than 20 million items were destroyed. The fire started in the auditorium and the primary cause of the fire was the air conditioner. There should be one circuit breaker for each air conditioner. In the specific case of the auditorium, there was one circuit breaker for three air conditioners, which didn't comply with the recommendations from the manufacturer. In Ecuador, a cross-party committee has been created by the members of the National Assembly to investigate its president, Elizabeth Cabezas. The committee was approved with 123 votes in favor and one abstention. Now, three assembly members will have to investigate the president of the assembly accused of blocking a corruption probe against President Lenin Moreno over the INA paper scandal. An audio was leaked in March where Cabezas was heard talking to the interior minister allegedly about the votes needed to prevent the investigation. This concerns the president of the National Assembly. We have to defend the institution. We do not have to be confused about this. This is not a criminal case. Recently, we received an important recommendation from the Observatory of the Legislative Power, and the reform of the legislative function is clear. These determination processes do not require to verify the legality of the evidence because we are not handling a judicial case here. Jamaica's ruling party has won in the hotly contested by-election in Portland Eastern. And Mary Vaz will be the first female member of parliament to present to represent the constituency. The seat was left vacant following the murder of MP Linvale Bloomfield in February. The win means the ruling party will increase its narrow house majority. Now to Bolivia. The government of Evo Morales has decided to increase its assistance to neighborhoods in several cities where the aim of providing solutions and improve the living conditions of residents. The state program is called Mi Barrio Mi Hogar or My Neighborhood My Home. Last year the project made improvements in 56 districts in La Paz and benefited more than 138,000 families in the country. We are much better. All this used to be dirt and very slippery. It's much better now. Our president has helped us a lot. It's good to have communal houses for young people. We want big venues to give our kids and young people workshops and guidance. The program is implemented through a lottery fund. The interested district, with wide participation from its residents, must develop a project and propose it to the State Social Investment Fund, which chooses the most creative proposal. We want to implement mesh protection for a wooded area. The Fehuve La Paz neighborhood is presenting the mesh project for the forest of Purapura. We are also presenting a tourism plan for the area. 
The approved projects don't require any money from the district. The maximum amount per project is close to half a million dollars, and the options are many. There are projects about equipment, some are about the environment and others are about roads. We're looking to improve parks, fields and social venues, as well as to stabilize or even renovate some surfaces. It's a common concern in La Paz. The program started last year with $10 million. This year, the government announced a $200 million fund for the whole nation as part of the redistribution of economic resources program generated by nationalization of the country's strategic industries. Paleontologists in Peru have discovered the fossil of a four-legged amphibious ancestor of whales. The discovery of the over 42 million year old specimen could provide new clues on the mammal's transition from land to the ocean. The fossil was found one kilometer inland from Peru's Pacific coast at Playa Media Luna. The animal was about four meters long and its anatomy shows similarities to present-day semi-aquatic animals like otters. This animal was still able to move on land, probably not in a very easy way, but in any case, it was still able to return to land to rest, to reproduce, to give birth to its young, behaviors such as this. And all at the same time, other characteristics of the hand, food, cattle region allow us to say that he was also a good swimmer. We'll be back very soon. Stay with us. Welcome back. Dozens of migrants in Greece have occupied the main train station in Athens, demanding that they be allowed to continue their journey to other European Union nations. The migrants said they want to leave Greece, where they believe there are more economic opportunities. Greece's border with North Macedonia has been fenced off and heavily policed for the past three years. More than 70,000 refugees and migrants are believed to live in Greece in the wake of a mass mass influx beginning in 2015. Two days, two days, no trains. No trains, uh, Saloni. Two days, uh, children, women, uh, old men, old women, uh, no eat, no water. But no uh, train to Saloni, uh, finish uh, train. Uh, I am going to Saloni in uh, Camp Diavana. Uh, for uh, Macedonia and Serbia and Bosnia and Croatia and uh, NAMSA and Germany, all our group. French President Emmanuel Macron has held a meeting with survivors of the 1994 Rwandan genocide. The meeting comes a few days after Macron turned down an invitation to attend the genocide commemoration event in the Rwandese capital Kigali. Relations between France and Rwanda have, have been frosty since the genocide that claimed over 800,000 lives. Rwanda accuses France of having provided equipment and training to the army and the Hutu militias that carried out the genocide. <laughs> Algerians have gathered for the first mass protest since the resignation of President Abdelaziz Bouteflika, now calling for the resignation of his allies too. Hundreds of thousands of protesters demanding radical change marched through Algiers for a seventh successive Friday. As Algeria's intelligence service chief was reportedly fired, no clear successor to Bouteflika has yet emerged. Protesters have made it clear they will reject any candidate with ties to the old government. This is a country of martyrs, not a country of thieves. They stole the country. Our children and brothers died as martyrs in the mountains, while they were studying and took jobs and positions they never gave up. We don't need them. We don't need them. We don't need them. The prosecutor of the International Criminal Court, the ICC, Gambian Fatou Bensouda, has been banned from getting a visa by the U.S. government over her office's decision to probe alleged war crimes by the U.S. in Afghanistan. She has been investigating atrocities committed by U.S. military and its allies in Afghanistan, a move that United States Secretary of State Mike Pompeo cautioned last month could lead to sanctions on ICC officials.
ICC judges are still reviewing materials and have not yet handed down a decision to open a formal investigation in Afghanistan. And Belgium has apologized for kidnapping children from African colonies. Belgium's Prime Minister apologized on Thursday for the segregation, deportation and forced adoption of thousands of children born to black Africans and married to white Belgians. This travesty happened during Belgium's colonial rule of Burundi, Congo and Rwanda. This is the first time that Belgium has recognized its responsibility for the harm it inflicted on the Central African nations, which is colonized for eight decades. On behalf of the federal government, I apologize to the mixed race people with roots in Belgian colonization and to their families for the injustice and suffering that they went through. I also wish to express all of our compassion for the African mothers whose children were torn away from them. I am very moved because after all these years the Prime Minister recognized what we have been through all these years. It is a recognition of what the Belgian state has done to us in collaboration with the church. They took away a part of our identity and now they admit that mistake. I feel a lot better now. And with that story, we've come to the end of this news brief. These and other stories, as always, find them on our website at telesorenglish.net. And also join us on social media. We are on Facebook, on Twitter, and on Instagram. For Telesor English, I am Estefania Bravo. Thank you for watching.